Welcome, and thank you for joining Philadelphia Magazine's ThinkFest 2021. My name is Ernest Owens, and I'm the editor-at-large for Philadelphia Magazine. And today we're joined by award-winning journalist, Aaron Haynes, the co-founder of the 19th and contributing editor of A More Perfect Union for the Philadelphia Inquirer. This session is sponsored by Penn Medicine, the birthplace for mRNA vaccines. The work of Penn Medicine researchers, Dr. Catalin Carrico and Dr. Drew Weissman has saved countless lives from COVID-19 and will undoubtedly save countless more. Thank you to Penn Medicine and the rest of our sponsors, which include Bank of America, St. Joseph's University, Western Governors University, and GoPub. Please remember to join us for these conversations all week at noon and 4 p.m. daily. If you miss any sessions, we invite you to check out the recordings at phillymag.com slash thinkfest. So Aaron, you've been living in Philadelphia for five years now, and you know, you're an Atlanta native, and you know, they just won the World Series. You know, Philadelphia has had um, one of those victories not too long yes. ago ourselves. But, you know, with so much going on in Atlanta with their mayoral race, a lot of stuff going on in their city, what makes you still invested in Philadelphia specifically? Well, you know, Ernest, I, I actually just rounded year six in Philadelphia. Uh, so, you know, I can't believe that it's already been uh, that long, you know, pandemic time, you know, what are, what are years, what are, what are hours, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I have to say that really from this, almost from the time that I arrived in Philadelphia, I just, I just fell in love with this place. It was a city that frankly, when I lived in Washington DC, which is the place that I was before I moved to Philadelphia, I was driving straight through here on my way to New York. I mean, most people know that story. Uh, you know, Philadelphia didn't even have a sign on the highway, uh, you know, on, on, on 95, when you were, uh, you know, trying to make your way to, to Brooklyn or Manhattan, uh, they didn't even acknowledge Philadelphia. And so uh, I think that that gives the city a bit of its, you know, kind of imposter underdog, just one more way to, to, to ding us. But within, I would say maybe a month, a month and a half of moving here, I was just like, why isn't everybody here? Why don't people know about this? Like, how was I just driving through this place? I love it so much. Uh, because I mean, the, from the people to the neighborhoods to obviously the food, um, it is just, it, it is an amazing uh, American city. And, and I have just been very um, happy and excited to call this place home. I think that that is probably why um, it has been, I feel like relatively easy for me to kind of become a Philadelphian. Uh, you know, one of my friends is a native here has kind of given me yeah. the title of half John. So uh, <laughs> I've been here for six years now, you know, I'm working, I'm working towards my full John status. I don't know what else I need to do to get there, but- um, I reached yeah. it at year 10. I reached it at, I became a full okay. John at that's year when, 10. That's when you get to full John status? I think okay. a decade, that's, that's good to know. you know, you gotta have that double digits. That's good to know. <laughs> but honestly, yeah, I mean, because the city has embraced me, uh, you know, and, and I have so much love for the city. I'm an ambassador for Philadelphia. There's so much here. And, and I think, you know, you know this as somebody who moved here and, and fell in love with the city too. Um, you know, oftentimes I feel like Philadelphia doesn't even know what it has. And yeah. so, you know, for folks like us to be here and, and to show the city to itself uh, in so many different ways, the good and the bad, honestly, uh, I think is important. Uh, but, but especially uh, the good, because there is a lot of potential here and there's a lot of good that's already happening here. Absolutely. Um, you know, both of us are from the South. You know, yes. you're from Atlanta. I grew up in Houston. Um, we argue that Houston is the culinary capital of the South. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we both came to Philadelphia and fell in love with the city, of course, as um, transplants. And, you know, both of us started off, I think, in our journalism career covering race um, and, yes. and how it involves Philadelphia before you became the editor at large for the 19th. And, of course, the new project you're working with, the Inquirer, that we'll be talking about. Um, you started off as a national race and ethnicity reporter here um, for the Associated Press. Mm -hmm. And what was that like coming into Philadelphia as a national reporter covering race, not just you know across the country, but also in Philadelphia and making those connections? What was that like? Yeah, well, you know, I think a couple of things on that. One, you know, from the time that I got into journalism, I got my start in journalism in the black press in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I worked at the Atlanta Daily World. And, uh, you know, when I was there, 
kind of got the foundation that has carried me through my career, regardless of where I've worked, which is that stories uh, centering Black people, Black life, right? Not, and which is not just Black trauma for people who don't understand the holistic view of what it means to be Black in America and what that says about our country and our democracy uh, was something that was very important to me and something that was reinforced and affirmed for me uh, because I started my career in the Black press. And so that was something I took with me throughout my career, even before I had the, you know, kind of official title of national race writer. And, you know, when I came to Philadelphia, uh, I was actually uh, still freelancing. I freelanced in Washington, uh, D.C. after I'd left the Washington Post, and that was going well. And, you know, I really didn't think that I was going to go back into a traditional newsroom uh, anytime soon. But, uh, you know, I came to Philadelphia. I had done a tour at the Associated Press in my hometown, Bureau of Atlanta, and so when I came to Philadelphia, I thought, well, let me just see if, if there's an opening in the Philadelphia Bureau. And lo and behold, there was. And not only was there an opening, but the opening was for a job called, you know, covering the urban affairs beat, which, you know, for those of us that are in the industry know that that means, you know, any, any and everything dealing with black and brown folks, right? Right. <laughs> uh, but, but Philly, uh, I quickly learned, was really one of the ideal places in this country to cover those issues. Obviously, we talk a lot about how the city is, is um, you know, has, has had the unfortunate distinction of being, you know, one of the poorest big cities in America, a lot of that affecting uh, people of color, other marginalized folks uh, in the city, uh, but, but also just has a really rich and robust uh, history uh, of, of, you know, along racial and, and ethnic lines, uh, you know, these neighborhoods with so much character and identity around race and ethnicity. Uh, there's a lot to mine there. There's a lot uh, to talk about in terms of race, I found out, you know, because I, again, I'm, I was trying to solve the mystery of like, why do I love Philadelphia so much, like within the first two months of me living here. And what I learned was, you know, Philly is was the third most popular stop on the Great Migration, right? So people yeah. from the South, like us, come to Philadelphia, uh, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, and make uh, their homes here, set, you know, set, settle down and, and put down roots here. And that is why, you know, there's kind of a Southern sensibility in certain parts of the city, especially with Black folks. Uh, you know, you meet people who, you know, are Philly natives, but it's like, okay, well, where are your grandparents from, though? And inevitably, they're yeah. going to name some Southern state, right? People use y'all uh, a lot that, here, That is Philly. Yeah, yeah, people use y'all a lot here. Exactly. Um, which is interesting like they use it naturally like you know they're like y'all I'm like interesting because their um, their southern yeah. kin came here you know yeah. uh you know almost a century ago so it, it really is kind of amazing to to think about that um but like I said I mean to, to cover race in America Philadelphia was an ideal place uh to do that and and I think it was really um you know my training and and career really served me well by the time I came here because uh, I was able to kind of see and write about those issues uh, from a national perspective uh, from one of the biggest cities in the country that is still very much grappling with those issues and that is outside of the South, which I think is important for people to understand race and racism and inequality, especially along racial lines, is not a problem in our country that is relegated to one section of the country. Absolutely. You know, I, when I think about those linkages between the civil rights movement, Philadelphia, us being the second largest city on the East Coast under New York, you know, it's, it's the, the conversations. I mean, growing up in Houston, you know, Juneteenth was something that we just always had, you yeah. know? And I know that in Atlanta, there's like that rich civil rights history with MLK and so many others um, that's rooted in Atlanta. Like, you know, I did a story about the black business community in Atlanta and how it's booming and how people talk about it being a Mecca of sorts. But then when you look at Philadelphia, there's still so much opportunity and history that isn't still explored in the same way. And celebrated um, in the same way. Yeah, right? celebrated. I think that's the, that's the right word. You know, I guess to your exploration being here for like half a decade, being a half John, as you describe yourself, um, what has it been like to see that difference in celebration or embrace of that history um, of Philadelphia and in Atlanta, that compare and contrast? I know you go back and forth yeah. between Atlanta to your family. Yeah. So, I mean, look, every city in this country, uh, as well as the country at large, loves you know, it, the story that it loves to tell, has a story that it loves to tell about itself, right? Uh, Philadelphia is no different. Um, and you know, I think that the story that I grew up learning about Philadelphia pretty much tracked with what 
uh, I got when I first arrived here. You know, if, if, if you kind of take the tourist view of things, right? What is, what is that story about Philadelphia? Well, it's a story about the founding fathers. It's a story about, you know, Philadelphia being this cradle of democracy. It's the Liberty Bell and it's the Declaration of Independence and it's the U.S. Constitution and it's the Constitution Center and, you know, all of these, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin, you know, all these, all these things that, that the city loves to kind of tout about itself. Uh, and, and so, you know, the part that I was looking for, you know, the connection that I was looking for culturally for me, uh, because I am certainly a lover of U.S. history, but especially of, of African American history, right? right? I'm looking for that, uh, you know, when I, when I come here, especially learning about, uh, you know, so many Black folks settling here during the Great Migration, uh, but learning just how, how culturally rich um, for us uh, this city always has been. And so, you know, one of the first books that I read uh, when I moved here was the Philadelphia Negro, you know, W.B. Du Bois's sociological excavation of this city, yeah. which frankly, I encourage people watching this to read because it's very prescient right now, uh, even though that book is over 100 years old, right? I like, think it was the first book I read when I came to Philadelphia. Yes. I think the yes. first like semester uh, when I was at Penn, you know, there was it's a so whole instructive, course about right? Philadelphia. Yeah. And I think that was the first start. And then everything else kind of was after that, even before the constitution, which is interesting. So because you read yeah. that and you come to understand why Philadelphia is set up the way it is, how certain neighborhoods exist the way they are, continue to exist the way that they are, like you, you know, how um black people settled when they came here and 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 the kinds of jobs that they settled into and how uh, you know, that is a legacy that still kind of lives with us today. Like it, it, it was fascinating, not to mention, by the way, this man drew all of his own like graphs and charts and, and it, you know, because it was, it was, you know, the early 20th century, like there wasn't, you know, he wasn't able to just do this on the, on his laptop. So um, it, it was kind of amazing, but, um, you know, I think cities like Houston, cities like Atlanta do tend to kind of put their black history a lot more front and center than Philadelphia does, yeah. um, you know, put it right up there with the George Washington, Benjamin Franklin stories, because the contributions of, of black people who are either from here or, have passed, or who have passed through here are really remarkable. And, and, and we don't talk about that nearly enough. The, the tradition of free black folks who were here and functioning, uh, you know, during its slavery, uh, but not only that, the black folks that, that, were, that were thriving uh, here during the great migration, we don't, we don't talk about that um, that legacy, because that is a spirit that is very much here for anybody that is willing to pay attention, but also uh, for, for younger Black folks who may not be aware of that history. Um, you know, that history has the ability to empower folks, right, or disempower folks. Right, right. And, and so that's why it's important for us to tell the whole story about Philadelphia and not just the parts that make certain people feel good or feel better. <laughs> so true. Um, so I, you know, we both have been writing about Philadelphia from different perspectives. One of the things that I have done when telling the story of Philadelphia and its evolution has been to consistently talk about the current topics that are happening, but then also talk about in, invoking that history yes. for context. They so when it. we talk about the history of policing in Philadelphia, you cannot not talk about the move bombing. Um, when you talk about the current issues around poverty in Philadelphia um, and some of the biggest um, improvements of Philadelphia, you can't ignore the conversation around gentrification. And so I have, you know, a lot of my columns and things that I write for for the magazine, I'm oftentimes integrating that history and that nuance um, to really, you know, help tell that evolving story of Philly. Um, what have you done um, and what's your approach to telling that story of Philadelphia? One, for those who live here, but also to the nation. You're on MSNBC. You're, you know, um, at the 19th, you're about to do this great project that's just actually launched not too long ago for the Philadelphia Inquirer. You got local, you got national, international to a certain extent. How are you telling that story? Yeah, I mean, look, I think what you're bringing up is so important because context does matter, right? People need to understand that none of this is happening in a vacuum. None of the, none of what the issues that we're talking about are not happening in isolation, right? Like they're intersectional. Uh, but not only that, uh, they are on a continuum of history in this country, which is why it is so important for us to know and learn our history. I mean, I'm just going to keep saying that uh, because, uh, you know, the past is, is, is present, very much present with us. Uh, I mean, literally present 
with us in this city, like, you know, you're on one block and, and there's Liberty Place, you know, kind of uh, just kind of shooting up into the sky. And then you go, you know, a couple of blocks over and there you are in Old City walking on the same cobblestones as Benjamin Franklin. Like it's, it, it's wild. Like literally you can, you can see these two things kind of coexisting. And, and so that um, really makes me think a lot, a lot. Uh, and I, I've written about this um, in the Inquirer. It, it makes me think a lot about what it means to be a citizen at this point in time, who gets to participate in this democracy, right? I, you know, seeing the reckoning last summer with, with that diverse coalition of protesters in the streets, you know, sustained for weeks. Uh, you know, I thought, you know, who, well, who does get to protest? And what is the story that we tell about the ongoing revolution, right? I mean, we love the American Revolution as an, as an origin story in, in Philadelphia, but uh, you know, what if we thought about that as the Museum of the American Revolution, one of my favorite places in the city does? Uh, what if we thought about this as an ongoing revolution and who gets to participate? Is that more inclusive? Are there more women, LGBTQ folks, the disabled community, other marginalized folks, people of color? Like who gets to be there? Because those folks were very much not excluded. You know what I mean? During the initial American Revolution, when, you know, 1776 happens, Everybody was not able to participate in the fruits of those efforts, right? They had to continue to fight uh, and, and are continuing to fight uh, for full and, and, and uh, for full inclusion in, into this democracy and for us to make those founding ideals that, that we celebrate uh, for being, you know, signed here, make those real. Absolutely. And, you know, that made me think about a really great series of work that you did last year um, for the Inquirer um, called Portraits of a Pandemic, which, you, which you won um, the prestigious um, Bernie and Jarrett um, medal for um, last year. And it was incredible work. I mean, you spotlighted so many different people from different backgrounds and identities in Philadelphia who were being impacted by the pandemic. And Absolutely. it was very intentional um, yeah. about who you use and whose stories. And it was a mist of everything that was going on. Um, could you talk a little bit about what was that process like telling that story, um, which wasn't happening in real time and it was incredible and what that meant for the world to see what was happening in Philadelphia and to specific communities that oftentimes don't get that light shed on. Yeah, listen, thank you so much for mentioning portraits because um, that uh, was some that was work that felt deeply meaningful to me at that time. Uh, you know, uh, just for a little backstory for everybody watching, I, uh, you know, we had just started the 19th, you know, just a few months before the pandemic, March. Yeah, I, you know, I thought January, February, I was on the campaign trail, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and then we get to mid March and you know, this country is on lockdown. Joe Biden is, you know, the presumptive nominee, but he's off the campaign trail. So as a political journalist, it was just kind of like, well, what are we supposed to do now? Everybody's just kind of looking around. Uh, and like I said, we had just started this brand new newsroom and we thought that our focus was going to be the 2020 election. Like that was going to be, you know, the show. And if you're a political journalist, I mean, you know, last year was supposed to be like the Super Bowl and then all of a sudden- Right. Kind of so, uh, you know, but, but honestly, um, you know, as I sat in my apartment in Philadelphia, uh, I realized fairly quickly a couple of things. One, um, that we had um, a pandemic that was going to disproportionately affect uh, not only people of color and marginalized folks, but especially women. And the other thing that I realized was that, um, you know, we had an opportunity to tell stories using that lens in Philadelphia which you know was already one of the most unequal cities in America before the pandemic, right? And so all of the issues that we've been talking about as a city were really just kind of laid bare in the pandemic. And so I thought, well, if I'm here anyway, <laughs> you know, what if I try to tell the story of the pandemic for us um, through the lens of one woman and one issue at a time in the poor city, that poorest big city in America, once a week? That was, that was the goal, that was the, the plan, that was how Portraits of a Pandemic kind of was born. And so um, I did that. Um, my first story was uh, about a pastor, uh, Leslie Callahan, who yeah. was trying to pastor, you know, Easter was coming. That was, that was I remember, uh, because I, I was writing it for, for the Easter season. She's trying to figure out, how am I going to pastor to these people virtually? How is that gonna work? 
And also just what does it mean if I can't be with these people, if they're not going to be in the pews, if we're not going to have the fellowship and the, you know, uh, of church. But I mean, it was just so, um, it was such a great conversation because I mean, her insights just in, even in the early stages of the pandemic were things that I continued to go back to during the pandemic. Uh, as it, you know, lingered on far longer than any of us could have imagined. I mean, I thought maybe I could write a few of these, uh, you know, before we were back out on the campaign trail. I ended up writing, I think, something around a dozen. Uh, yeah, I remember. The campaign just went on and on, and it was just like, well, we just, you know, we'll find somebody else to write about this week. And there was no shortage of women who were absolutely resilient, absolutely responding to and being impacted by this crisis. And quite frankly, who were in such survival mode that nobody was really asking them like how are you navigating this and also just how are you doing you know and so for them to have a even just a moment a conversation with a reporter where they're able to reflect on that um that really felt like my best and highest use as a journalist at that time i mean yes the campaign came back into focus later but you know what was important about that like because i'd had those conversations I realized like that the pandemic was absolutely political for people and that it was gonna motivate people, Philadelphians included, um, to the polls in November. And that's exactly what you saw happening. Absolutely. What were some of the, who were some of the people that you did interview? I mean, there was so many. Like, absolutely. I, I, yeah, there was, there was Leslie Callahan, who was, who was that teacher? I mean, who was that pastor? I interviewed a teacher. I interviewed a small business owner. I interviewed uh, Sharon Cooks, uh, you know, for Pride Month, who, who talked about um, you know, her, uh, her amazing journey and, and really, um, you know, pride happening in the midst of this racial reckoning that we were dealing with as a country. And so really talking about the intersection of race and gender and, and the reckoning that needed to happen around some of that. Um, just, I, I had just every, every time I was blown away by uh, these, these women's stories because they were so powerful and, and up, uplifting, but also, I mean, they just all have so much going on, even yeah. in the midst of this pandemic. It was just, um, uh, honestly, I mean, those stories, because I think we were all just kind of struggling as, as it just continued to go on and on, those stories really were sustaining me in that early period. Um, because they were, I'm like, well, if these women are doing all of this, like I, I definitely need to keep going right. <laughs> because they're, they're doing a lot of times they were doing it with fewer resources than me, uh, but they yeah. were making it happen because that is, that is what, uh, women and, and marginalized folks in this country do and have done. Uh, but they definitely were very adamant that, that things had to be different on the other side of this pandemic in terms of race, in terms of gender. Uh, as well as in terms of this global public health crisis that we were all addressing and experiencing. Absolutely. You know, I think what I really loved the most about the project was how it showed a different level of Philadelphia women, but also spoke to the scrappiness of the city. Yes. And yes. the many women who lived, who has lived here for years. Who gets and, to be an underdog, right? Like, because right. there's a certain image of what that is and what P.S. Rocky, let's just, let's just be clear. <laughs> right. you know, but these women, these women were, were were the Rockies of their households, of their communities. Absolutely. They were. And so be, to be able to cast them that way felt very important. No, totally. And I, you know, thinking about it in general, like you said a little bit earlier, how this was kind of interviewing them helped set the tone in a way of like what those issues were on the ballot yes. um, in 2020. You know, it, what I thought was great was that it wasn't like, hyperly political in your face yeah. but it was interesting because a lot of the issues that were being talked about by candidates um during the election was reflected in this in a way that didn't seem slanted you know one way or the other i mean there were a lot of progressive ideals and views but just knowing the issues and seeing how these knowing people were going to show lives. up to the polls yes how they've incredible. been impacted by you know, what, what, whatever we were, we were talking about in any given week, right? I mean, because we know, yes, these issues, things like education or, or things like business, th these issues on their face are, are nonpartisan, right? But they are absolutely political. Absolutely. So, you know, transitioning from one project to the next, you know, <laughs> that project was award-winning. Um, it was definitely incredible. And that was, you know, a big highlight for me, at least in my journalism reading of 2020. Mm -hmm. Now we're into 2021. We are. And you are, you know, you're kicking it forward. I mean, you're on the, you know, the, you know, the list of most influential Philadelphians and 
whatnot. You're um, Thank you. on the board of the Linfest Institute. Very fortunate. <laughs> right, you're on the Linfest Institute board, um, which is in I Philadelphia. Am. So you're really sticking your your roots deep in Philly. You, you look like a lifetime resident. You know, you guys are trying to keep me here. I can tell. I'm feel. I'm feeling the sisterly affection. One thousand yes. percent. One thousand. And I mean, you're a frequent traveler of South. That just seems to be sure. your favorite restaurant in Philly. Listen, I mean, can I? Somebody please reach out to me with the best sweet tea in Philadelphia and I may not need to come home again. I don't know. Right. <laughs> and now you're um, launching into a new project with the Philadelphia Inquirer. You're yes. the contributing editor and the creator of A More Perfect Union, um, which has really kicked off. It kicked off uh, 4th of July, Independence Day. And there you were at the, you know, the Revolution Museum, one of your yeah. favorite places. One of my favorite places. In a red dress slaying announcing you know this 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 project looking like yeah. miss late liberty 2021 <laughs> you're hilarious listen I mean, thanks for bringing up a more perfect union i'm very yeah. very very excited uh to be uh helming this project uh because i do believe that um you know as journalists we get great ideas if we're lucky <laughs> you know we yeah. get great ideas uh, in our careers, and I really, this really did feel like um, the right city, uh, the right newspaper, uh, and and I felt like I was the right person, uh, really, to help to um, tell the story about Philadelphia, and also um, because I care so much about this city, and because I see where we can go as a city, as a country, as a democracy. Uh, bringing all that together uh, in one project uh, that really not just shows us uh, who we have been, but, but who we can be, right? As these, you know, as a city that, that touts itself as a pioneer of democracy, uh, that is so proud of the founding ideals that have shaped this entire country. Like those things are not stagnant. Those things are living and breathing and evolving in our city, in our country, and we as Philadelphians, I mean, it, I, I feel like we almost have a responsibility to carry that work forward, uh, not just for ourselves, but for our fellow American citizens. Um, and so for people who don't know, um, the backstory for a more perfect union, last summer during the, the, um, the reckoning, which really was a reckoning around institutional inequality, yeah. right? And so I'm thinking about this um, and I'm really starting to wrap my mind around the idea that, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin was prolific, you know, invented mm -hmm. many things, started many institutions right here in this city, whether we're talking, I mean, a lot of, uh, so many of, of the institutions that we, that, that continue to be impactful on our lives today were started in Philadelphia, whether we are talking about your beloved alma mater, uh, the yes. University of Pennsylvania being the first, uh, you know, university or you know, the first bank, uh, the first um, uh, penitentiary, Eastern State. Yeah, you know, people, yeah. people walk by there every day on their way to some restaurant, right? Without knowing that history. Uh, there's so, so, so many firsts uh, in Philadelphia. I, I was at the Betsy Ross house not that long ago. I mean, we, we don't have an American flag if it is not for Philadelphia. Uh, but what really occurred to me as I was thinking about those kind of institutional firsts was that if we, uh, if those institutions were born here, then inequality was also born here because those institutions inherently are unequal. They remain unequal. And that inequality was baked in from the beginning. And so that is something that we need to talk about in the same way that we talk about the framers and, 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 and the Liberty Bell and, and the American Revolution and all of the rest of it. Like we have to talk about that. And if, if we are proud of these institutions, uh, that have, you know, some of them have a lot to be proud of for sure. Right. <laughs> um, you know, we tell the full story about them too, right? Uh, and not this is not about making anybody feel bad or shaming anyone. It is about right. having the historical foundation, that context, right, that we both know is so important um, to, you know, when you know better, you do better. And so having that information means that you are able to make a different choice. But these are choices. All of all, everything that happens within these institutions is about people making certain choices. And collectively as Philadelphians, we have the ability to come together to make a different choice about who we wanna be as a city 
and uh, you know, as an extension, who we wanna be as a country and who we wanna be as a democracy. And so I assert, and our project is going to assert that you know, we can move in the direction of perfecting this union, but we have to decide to do that together. We have to, but we also have to understand why that is necessary and that the legacy of those institutions is still very much present in modern day Philadelphia modern day Philadelphians living right now are experiencing, they are on the receiving end and they are also benefiting from that legacy, right? Well, you know, such optimism, so Philly. I think you're a full John now. <laughs> Wait, you're elevated, breaking news. I think you made it, I think you made it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I will say, you know, um, wrapping up is that, you know, you're right. I think a lot of times when telling the story of Philadelphia, um, as journalists, as, as thought provokers, you know, the idea of telling truth um, without shame, I think, yes. is what makes us a city. Um, and that not just the truth, it makes us feel good. Right. All of it. Right. All of yeah. it. Like that, and that it's is, important. Yeah. Who are we as journalists if we are not leaving behind the most honest and accurate record of who we are? That is our job. Absolutely. I 100% I agree. And I think you know, in telling this story, I mean, our journeys, you know, our histories from the South to, yes. to the North and, you know, seeing how this city has evolved and just not forgetting those roots as we look forward. I think you're, you're doing incredible work to do that. And, you know, I'm grateful and happy that you um, took some time out to chat with us today um, about that work. Um, is well, there any lasting note you want everyone, Philadelphians to know? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, your work and your witness here in this city as a transplant has been so vital because, you know, I truly believe that, that as journalists, our lived experience is our superpower. The lens that we bring based on the experiences that we have, um, you know, where we come from, who we are, our various identities, like all of that plays into how we are going to be able to see and shape stories, the decisions we make about who to cover, what to cover, what not to cover, right? These are all very important. These are all very important. And, and you being, you know, one of the gatekeepers of, of that work as, as editor at large over there is, is at Philly Mag is, is, is hugely valuable. The story, you know, you th again, just tying history into this, the story that Phyllis Wheatley would have told about Philadelphia is not the same story that George Washington would have told about Philadelphia, which is why it's important to have both. It's important to have everybody's voice uh, you know, seen and heard in this democracy. And so, you know, that is really uh, my aim. I know it's your aim as, as a journalist is to bring more people into this conversation, into our democracy and really into our city so that we all uh, can embrace what it means to, to be a Philadelphian uh, and the truth of that and, and our obligation to uh, show that brotherly love and sisterly affection uh, to, to make this a more perfect union. So thank you for having me. Thank you for having, for being here. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, check you out. Follow her on Instagram, Twitter. She's on social media. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I take all, any and all Philadelphia recommendations. I That's truly, right. truly love this city <laughs> so much. And I am, I am uh, your biggest ambassador from Atlanta. Awesome.